We have a month-long series. Now, if you are new here today and you, uh, you have never heard me preach before, you will uh, be witnessing something that is a bit of a miracle. I very rarely uh, put a tag on a series, maybe a title, but I never put a tag or a time limit on, on a series that I do because I leave it open for the Lord to move. But we're going to take the month of November the month of November, not just one day. We're going to take the month of November and we're going to give thanks to the Lord every Sunday and every Wednesday. And I pray, my prayer is, is that I give you a biblical reason, even as I am in a theological class now, a theological reason for you to praise God. That you can praise God not just because you're supposed to, that you can praise God not just because, you know what, the Bible says He's praiseworthy. But you can praise God because you recognize His relationship to you and His relationship through Jesus Christ and your relationship to Him. And you can give thanks to Him for the things that you have and are you ready for this? Because this is what we're going to talk about today. You can give thanks to Him this month, and indeed the rest of your life, if you're so inclined, you should be, for the things that you don't have. For the things that you don't have. There's so many people in this room right now don't have cancer. Praise God. There's so many people in this room right now that don't have male pattern baldness. Sorry, Mike. Praise God for that. No, my friends, let me tell you, there's so many things in our life that we can praise God for not having, not the least of which, for the Christian, is not having eternal damnation. So when we sing, this is the day that the Lord has made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. The Christian can say that because we know we live in a new day. We live in a new day, and indeed, God is writing a new song. The Bible says that in Revelation that they're going to sing a new song. They're going to, so they're going to sing a new song in, in, in those days, in those eschatological days, those last days. They're going to sing a new song, but they're writing that song. That song is being written in the hearts of the believers now. This new song unto the Lord. And every note, every syllable, every beat is being written in the hearts and minds and spirits of the born-again Christian today. Because today is the day that the Lord has made. And we will rejoice and be, get, be glad in it. Psalm 100 is our jumping off psalm. Then we'll be going to Psalm 136. Uh, Miss Lana and our greeting time and everything has given me plenty of time. I promise I will not preach for an hour and 45 minutes like my brother Ron did. But we are going to preach through the whole thing. So... Hold on to your hats. Psalm 100. It's on page 691 in my Bible, if that helps you. Psalm 100, verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. 
This is a proper way to come before the Lord in worship. Amen? Thank you, Miss Lana. Thank you for always endeavoring to bring joy with you into uh, the pulpit and into worship as you lead us. And thank you, Lord, for filling your people with praise. Did you know the Bible says that God inhabits the praise of his people? God inhabits the praise of his people. When we begin to praise God, he is not just there in the midst of two professing Christians, which the Bible also does say, where two or more are gathered in his name, there he is, Jesus, in the midst. But it, he says, specifically in the book of Hebrews, that God inhabits the praise of his people. When we were rejoicing in that last song, uh, and I was up here as I joined the choir on stage, uh, I, I was thinking of this as I looked out and I thought, look at what you are doing, Lord. In the midst, again, of a worldwide pandemic. Uh, in the midst of uh, presumed lockdowns again. God's people are praising you. And you are inhabiting their praise because you are praiseworthy. Help me, Father, to be worthy. Verse 2, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. Yes, it's totally appropriate to sing unto the Lord. Now, some, some get a little bent out of shape that we sing so much. They would like to hear the word more. Well, I understand that. And indeed, we will have eternity to sing. I've said in the past that Brother Roach, as a, uh, a song leader, he is, he's got job, uh, job security because we're going to be singing for all eternity. I don't know that I'm going to be preaching or teaching for all eternity. We'll be in the presence of Jesus. You got a question about, you know, uh, Leviticus? You can just go right to the one who, who wrote it. You're not going to need pastors and, and teachers then and preachers. Ah, but I tell you what, Brother Roach, we're going to need song leaders. We're going to need song leaders. Thank God for you. Thank God for Miss Lana. Know ye that the Lord, know ye that the Lord, He is God? See, it's one thing to say, oh, Jesus, you are Lord. But He's God. And the Bible says there is no other God before Him. Uh, I've tried desperately not to mention my college. More specifically, I've tried desperately not to whine about my college. Nobody wants to hear that. But uh, I am in this theological class, and it's interesting uh, because I have read theologians most of my adult life. Um, I'm not so much complaining about it or whining about it, but I will comment on it in this sense. Uh, I am wrestling with a man who has his doctorate in theology, who, who is desperately trying to get me to cite, chapter and verse, all of the theologians that are commenting on the Bible. And here, I just want to comment, I just want to quote the Bible. If we do, if we, in our study of God, are not informed about God by His Word, we swim in the ignorance of our own experience and perspective. The Bible is its own best commentary on the author. And here, here the Bible says that the Lord is God. What does that mean? He is from everlasting to everlasting. There was none before Him, there are none after Him. He alone is sovereign, almighty, omnipotent. Amen. He is the author of life. And He alone, He alone has the right to take it. Think about that as you go into the voting booths. That's about as political as I'll get. Know ye that the Lord, He is God... It is He that hath made us, and not we ourselves. Uh, we are His people, and the sheep of His pasture. You know, uh, I, I, it, it was Thursday of this last week that I finally 
let my hair down. Now, I got my hair cut and I shaved my beard. You guys can see that, obviously. But I let my hair down and I finally felt like, okay, whew, I'm, I'm actually away from work. Uh, up until then, I had been online. I had been working uh, with uh, Brother Dave down in Florida, uh, trying to promote our relaunch of our website, um, checking our uh, attendance. By the way, uh, Desert Hills, will you please raise your right hand? Okay. Now pat yourself on the back. Because we didn't have a drop in attendance when I left. Instead, everybody kept coming to church. Praise the Lord. Do you know why? Because you're the sheep of his pasture. Not Pastor Scott's, not Pastor Rogers, not Jack Anderson, not Mario Smith. Okay? But you're the sheep of his pasture. This is why I could go to pretty much any church, and as long as it is spirit filled, you know what? I'll hear of the Lord. I'll hear from the Lord. Even a broken clock's right twice a day. But I thank God for you coming because you're the sheep of his pasture. And, and I did rest in at least that. That I know that you are in his hands and he has the whole world in his hands. But especially and specifically those who are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. Let me challenge you today. Have you received the blood of Jesus Christ to cover your sins? If not, you will die in your sins. Rest assured of that. You have no sacrifice for your sins. There are, there are no good works that you can do. No, not, not any. Not enough. Only the work of Jesus Christ, the redeeming work of Jesus Christ on the cross, is enough to cover your sins. His resurrection is proof that He was God in the flesh. And He sits at the right hand of the throne of majesty, even now, making intercession. What does that mean? He's basically talking to God the Father on our behalf. The devil comes and says, look what Scott did. Jesus goes to the Father and says, he's with me, Lord. The devil says, look what Mike did. And Jesus goes to the Father and says, Dad, that one's bought by my blood. I paid his price. To this day, he does it for every born-again Christian. If you have not that blood on the doorpost of your heart, my friend, you are lost. But i got good news for you. Though your salvation costs Jesus everything, it's free to you. Will you choose Him today? Enter His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. Be thankful unto Him and bless His name, for the Lord is good. Amen? For the Lord is good. His mercy, His mercy, His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endureth to all generations. Turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 136. His mercy, His mercy is everlasting. And His truth endureth to all generations. Now, His mercy doesn't endure to all generations. But His truth does. What does that mean? The truth of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, dying once for all, but especially unto those who place their faith and trust in Him as their all-sufficient sacrifice. That truth remains forever. And they will spend eternity with God the Father. Those who deny Him, those who refuse Him, those who do not place their faith and trust in Him, that truth remains the same forever and ever, regardless of how sorry you may feel in eternity. Regardless of how, how bad you wish you had changed your mind in eternity. Regardless of who's praying for you after you die. See, where, wheresoever a tree fall, so let it lie. That's what the Bible says. There are no second chances after death. That truth remaineth for all eternity. That's why the Christian learns very keenly at a young age. And that age could be at 35 when you're just born again or five years old when you become born again that we are blessed by not getting what we really do deserve. Christianity 101 
Grace is getting what we don't deserve. We get sonship. We, we get relationship. We get to become royalty. Because why? We are now related to the King of kings and the Lord of lords through the blood of Jesus Christ. We get that by God's grace. Unmerited favor. Uh, but we don't get what we do deserve. What we do deserve is hell. Here uh, this last month, uh, I have had the opportunity to take time and slow down just enough to round out the bases of games I have been playing for 30 years. And as God has allowed me this time to round out these bases, He has given me greater perspective and showed me even more so how great His mercy has been and not only me, but my entire family. As uh, I finally have been able to just sit down and listen and wait upon the Lord and His people, uh, things have uh, bubbled to the surface. And as they have, I have dealt with them uh, through prayer and uh, through meditation, one by one. And just like David, when he had uh, suffered one of his worst defeats, I went back and strengthened myself in the Lord. And God showed again His mercy is everlasting. So let us look here at Psalm 136. And I, I don't even know if I'm going to stop and, and preach through it. I just want you to hear it over and over and over again. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for He is good. For His mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks unto God, uh, the God of gods, for His mercy endureth forever. O oh, give thanks to the Lord of lords, for His mercy endureth forever. Three times the Holy Spirit puts that down. The Holy Spirit found an incumbent to reiterate that three times for you, Christian, as a reminder that we are not getting what we really do deserve. This ought to be a reminder to us when we are so keen to take aim at that one who has transgressed and slowly pull the trigger and give them what they deserve. Careful now. Careful. To Him alone doeth great works, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him that by wisdom made the heavens, for His mercy endureth... What does, what, what does His mercy have to do with the heavens? Well, I'm glad you asked. God doesn't just have a relationship with people. He has a relationship with His entire creation. Do you know that your Bible says that all of creation mourns and groans even today because of the fall of mankind? No. Sin has corrupted everything, but His mercy endureth forever. To Him, verse 6, to Him that stretched out the earth above the waters, for His mercy endureth forever. To Him that made great lights, for His mercy endureth forever. The sun to rule by day, for His mercy endureth forever. The moon and stars to rule by night, for His mercy endureth forever. To him that smote Egypt. Aha! No mercy for Egypt. Hold on a second. See? This is one of those things. Being a theologian, it might not help if you don't know your Bible. Uh, God's, not one of God's attributes, His justice, His grace, His mercy, not one intercedes or infringes upon the other. And God, God is in His wisdom, has given us the truth in His Word. Turn with, me into, uh, turn with me to Luke chapter 1, verse 49 and 50. Luke chapter 1, verse 49 and 50. 
For he that is mighty, for he that is mighty, hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. And his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. His mercy is on them that fear him. Now, for you uh, Green Beret Bible scholars in here, you probably know a little bit about Egypt. Oh, Egypt had no fear of the Lord. Egypt, as a matter of fact, represented by Pharaoh, said, when Moses came and said, let my people go, he said, no, 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 you're not going anywhere. Ten plagues came upon them, and culminating in the tenth and final plague of the firstborn of every, every creature dying, even the cattle, Finally, he says, uh, he says, go ahead, take everything, get out. Not because of mercy, but because he had finally relented. But even then, he chased them down. You know, by the way, it's one of the reasons, one of the things, when the lockdowns first occurred, I went to the Bible, I says, okay, where is it in here? I says, we, we shouldn't congregate. Where, where, where? But you know one of the things I found in there? I found... That when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, he also said, we're going to go out into the wilderness and we're going to worship together. And Pharaoh said, not a problem. You leave the kids and the cattle here and y'all go out there and worship. And Moses said, no, we all go or none of us go. We all go and congregate or none of us go. We are here. We are the church. We are the congregation. Amen? No, he shows mercy upon those who fear him. Let's go back to Psalm 136. To him that smote Egypt in the firstborn, uh, uh, for his mercy endureth forever. Mercy on Israel. Why? They feared him. And brought out of Egypt from among them, for his mercy endureth forever. You said, but serious, still though, didn't, Aren't, aren't, aren't the Egyptians made in his name? Turn with me back to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. James chapter 2 and verse 13. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. There is no mercy for those who show no mercy. James chapter 2. In verse 13, for he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy. Ah, and mercy rejoiceth against judgment. We rejoice because God, God has staved his judgment from us because of the blood of his son, the Lamb of God, come to take away the sins of the world. His truth endureth forever. His mercies are everlasting, but his judgments are upon those who do not fear him. And he shows no mercy to those who show no mercy. I remember back when I was just a lowly deacon, you know. That's a, that, that is a joke. There's no spiritual hierarchy in God's family. The deacon is no more spiritually inferior than to the pastor or any member of the church, then the pastor is spiritually superior than any saint in the church. Different functions, different roles, yes. But when I was a pastor, we had a church function here on the campus, and we had a man. I say he was a man. I think he was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Don't know his heart. But based upon his question, it did have me thinking. He was stalking one of our women here. So... Uh, myself, with one of the security, pulled him aside, said, sir, can we help you? And he goes, well, I came here to be a part of the church function. I said, but you're not a part of the church. We'd like to know, is there anything that we can help you with? He goes, yeah, there's a question. Why won't God save the devil? I says, I'm not going to get involved in some theological debate. I told him point blank the truth of the word. Why? Because it endures forever. God will show no mercy to those who show no mercy. Next question. When has the devil shown mercy to anyone? Ever. 
Now, there are other reasons too, but again, I'm not going to waste my time wrestling with the pig. You both get dirty and the pig likes it. <laughs> Verse 12, with the strong hand and with the stretched out arm, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which divideth the Red Sea into parts, for his mercy endureth forever. And hath made Israel to pass through the midst of it, for his mercy endureth forever. For those of you who are struggling with baptism, what I want to tell you is this, is Israel as a nation was a type and a foreshadow of the individual. The individual doesn't go through the Red Sea. The individual now is baptized through immersion, showing that they have been born again and delivered by God and the blood of the Lamb. There's no Red Sea that need be parted, but you, by obedience, show you are saved and that you're a recipient of His mercy through baptism. You see how the Bible, the entire Bible, is a study unto itself. You need not any theologian. Just look up the verse. Look up the verse. What does this mean? Brought them through the midst of the Red Sea. What is that? Well, you find out in the New Testament that they were all baptized with Moses through the Red Sea. It's a symbol of baptism, folks. To him which led his people through the wilderness, for his mercy endureth forever. To him which smote great kings, for his mercy endureth forever. And slew famous kings, for his mercy endureth forever. Sion, the king of the Amorites, his mercy endureth forever. Og, the king of Bashan, his mercy endureth forever. And he gave their land for a heritage, for his mercy endureth for how long? Forever. And an heritage unto Israel, his servant, for his mercy endureth forever, who, were mem who remembered us in our low estate. Even... You ready for this? The New Testament equivalent. Are you ready? Say amen. amen. Who remembered us in our low estate, even while we were yet still sinners. He died for us. Which one of you have been told, get your act together, then he'll save you? That's a lie. That is a lie. Be ye holy, then he will glorify you. That is a lie. Repent. Believe. Receive. Then you will be saved. You will be made holy. Until the day you die, you will be being made holy. That's called sanctification. And then upon the day of your resurrection, you will be glorified. Not because of anything you have done, but because of what Christ has done. That doesn't exclude any good works. The Bible is clear on this. Ah, the born-again Christian is made unto good works. Oh, look at Gary over here. I'm so jealous of his hair, I can't stand it. <laughs> Man comes with his wife to the, the trunk or treat. Seth sets up, i got to tell you, Gary, the second coolest trunk the first coolest, coolest goes to Shannon and, and Misty because they were at the up house. I thought that was pretty cool. How old are your kids, man? They're all grown. Your, the fact of the matter is, Gary, this one makes me so jealous of his hair, Joe. His kids are as old as I am. He's got more hair than me. <laughs> Why on God's good green earth would that man come and hand out candy and Bible tracts. Don't think I didn't see those Bible tracts. Because my grandson told me all about them. He says, I got a comic book from the guy that was a knight. I said, I know, that's a chick track. I like that. Let's check it out. Why in God's good green earth would that man right there come and hand out candy and Bible tracts the Saturday before what they called the devil's night? He's made unto good works, that's why. The man's a recipient of mercy and grace in his life. 
His children didn't come. Fact of the matter is, Gary, I don't even think your grandkids came, did they? But I will tell you this, as your pastor makes me no less grateful, it makes me proud to be your pastor. No, we are to have good works. We're, we're to show ourselves approved. Study to show yourself approved. That's not just for the preacher boy. That's not just for the pastor, the deacon, or the teacher. That's for us all. Uh, amen? Amen? But don't think that you're earning brownie points with God because you're doing all those things. Uh, that's your reasonable service. That's what the Bible says. Why? Well, because we recognize and we give thanks. Verse 26. We give thanks unto God, the God of heaven, that his mercy endureth forever. This month we give thanks that we don't receive what we do deserve. Now you say, well, yeah, there are those in my life like Egypt. Boy, I tell you what, they don't know. fear the Lord. I'm really going to give them what they do deserve. Hold on a second. Easy, slow your roll there. You know what I would imagine God would have you do? Maybe show some grace and mercy on them first. We were talking in our Sunday school this morning that Jesus said when you stand praying, when you stand praying, Forgive. Forgive. As your Father in heaven forgives you. Why? Well, I guess that's pretty reasonable service too, is it not? I mean, while we were yet still sinners, lost in our wayward, shaggy dog ways, uh, Christ died for us. Are you somehow super special because you just recognized it? No. See, that's one, that's one of the many wonderful things, Ray, I love about Christianity is that it's a level playing field. See, we're all bought by the same blood. See, no, nobody stands any taller than the other. Uh, we're all bought by the same blood. Our sin is all seen, as far as I'm concerned, all seen is the same. And, and in that, in that, we're all just as equally as deserving as hell, uh, of hell. Ah, but for the grace and mercy of God. Give thanks for that, and when you stand praying, forgive. Forgive. Even as you have been forgiven. One of the questions I asked this morning, and I got to tell you, uh, Terry, I don't know about your class, man, but I think we got some of the smarter. Georgianne? Well, you got some smart Christians in your class too, but I, I think we have some of the smartest Christians in my class. I asked this question this morning, and I said, why, why don't we forgive? Boom, right there, pride. I said, okay, come on now. Let's hear that. Young lady said, pride, and, and we think, well, I don't deserve this. I get to hold you accountable. I said, there it is. You get something. It is your pride. And you get. So why don't we forgive? Well, we don't forgive first because of our pride. That's the sin that de made the devil fall. Easy now. And secondly, power. Pride and power. As long as you don't forgive, you get to hold something over someone else. Now, let's boil that down to Christ, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit. What if they decided to hold even one of your sins over you? I've been trying to lose weight this last month. Hit a wall at 20 pounds, Mike. Pray for me. What if he just decided to hold the sin of gluttony over my, mind, over my life? I'll be damned forever, Mike. Damned forever over the sin of gluttony. And it's not my fault he made food taste so good. <laughs> but we don't blame God. Who, who, who does the responsibility lie with? The responsibility lies with us. But who is it that paid the price? He did. So why is it that we hold others? To a higher standard 
that God, then God holds us to. We talk about Christianity 101 and I wrestle with this professor of theology and I wonder, does he know how to forgive? How many people has he won to Christ? Has he done so with eloquent platitudes or with the sweet aroma of the love of our Savior? I pray that that is what people smell on us. I was speaking with a young man here the other day, and he says, you know, uh, sorry I was late to this, that, and the other. Got to talk, and this person just started to pour out their, their life to me. And I said, well, yeah, that's the Lord. And he, he looked at me, what do you mean? I said, yeah. I said, Marcel said it a long time ago. It's like they smell Christ on you. I've, I've been sitting in the middle of the DMV. You know how the DMV is. You're praying to God, get in and out of there as fast as you can. This is even before COVID. You don't want to rub up against these people. Have they even bathed? I don't know. Sorry, I'm telling you what goes on in my brain. You sit down, you're waiting for the number to be called. B3, B3, B3. Hi, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good to see you. Good to see you. Where are you from? Well, I'm from Las Vegas. Oh, yeah, me too. Oh, okay, well, that's weird. <laughs> My dog died. Tell me all about it. <laughs> I don't say that flippantly. I say that because, you know why? We have a ministry. It's a ministry that is supposed to be guided by compassion and love. Discernment, no doubt. You know, discernment, no doubt. But we have a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling the lost unto God the Father, and then one to another, fathers to sons. Turn with me to Philippians. I want to tell you what God put on my heart this morning besides giving thanks for his mercy Philippians chapter 1 God gave me thanks for his people you Desert Hills you Andrew Bergen Larry Miles Ken Henson, the men who helped with that fence. Yes, I saw the pictures, and I was in seventh heaven, if there is such a thing. Paul writes the Philippians, and I, I, I can almost scratch the surface of his joy knowing how the work of God continues in my presence, out of my presence, with or without me, God is God. Philippians 1 and verse 2, Grace be unto you, Desert Hills Baptist, and peace. Grace, the means by which you are saved. Peace, the result thereof. Peace with God. Peace from God. Grace be unto you, Desert Hills Baptist. Peace from our God, from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, church. Always in every prayer of mine, for you and all making request with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel. The good news. From the first day until now. Being confident in this very thing. That he. God. Which hath begun a good work. In you. Will perform it. Until the day. Of Jesus Christ. 
God's not going to give up on you. Don't give up on him. I thank God for you, Bill, Kim, all the men and women who continue to work in anonymity, who continue to give uh, little as much when God is in it. Uh, I shared this morning with my class, Ed Sweeten, who has a greater perspective than I, because he's old. <laughs> said he can't believe what God does here with so little. Told you I went to the million dollar church. $12,054 a week is their budgeted need. With <laughs> less half than that. Hey, it's not about money. It's about faith. It's about mercy. It's about gratitude. It's about praise and thanks for who God is, what God's doing, and that He's not going to quit. That He's going to continue that good work in you, Desert Hills. He's going to continue that good work in you, Christian, until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't give up on Him. Just keep praising Him. Just keep praising Him. You sin, repent. Confess to Him. He's faithful and just to forgive you. Amen. Cleanse you of all iniquity. Let's sit there and muddle around with it and move forward. I'm not saying you shouldn't have some godly sorrow over your sin. Absolutely. I don't know if you've got, you got to wallow around in it. Let everybody know just how sorry you are. Who's that for? Your eyes, my eyes, or God's eyes? Repent. Receive that forgiveness and trust that not only has He forgiven you, shown you mercy, but are you ready for this? He's forgotten about it. Which is a characteristic, let's face it, us human beings don't necessarily have. I'll leave you with this and then we'll pray. I spoke with a pastor friend of mine who had gone through very, very difficult trials early on in his pastorate. Fact of the matter is, the trials were mostly brought on by himself. And uh, he had driven every mentor in his life, out of his life, by his own obstinate ways. I've done much the same many times in my life, so I'm no one to judge, just observe. I told him, I said, brother, I said, and, and by the way, he stepped out of the ministry. He's back in the ministry now. This is wonderful. Stepped out of the ministry for a minute. But I did tell him, so brother, all I will tell you is that at some point, I think that God will use all of these experiences to mentor a young pastor on what not to do. And I said, uh, and then when you stand before the Lord and you give account, at least you'll be able to say, Lord, I used these foibles, these missteps, these issues uh, to eventually right wrongs. And you know what the man said? He said, or he could just say, what are you talking about? And I looked at him and I go, what do you mean? Here, I'm thinking I'm being all deep. You know, I'm being all deep and spiritual. Like, oh, no, 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 you don't understand. God's going to use all your mess-ups, brother. You know, uh, how you really mess this up, remember? Uh, you're going to use all these mess-ups uh, to help somebody else. He says, yeah, or God will just say, oh, I forgot all about that. What are you talking about? Because, see, God says that he will forgive our sins and remove them from us as far as the east is from the west, that he will forget our sins and never bring them into remembrance. And I went, whew. Hey, you know what? I think you're right. Now, invariably, there's that one guy that says, well, the Bible says that God is angry at the wicked every day. He is. Those who do not fear him. Those who show no mercy. No mercy will be shown. Ah, but those who fear him, those who repent, those who 
believe and receive. Ask for forgiveness. His mercy endureth for. Who wants some of that? 